Good morning, friends. Welcome back. I'm excited that you're here to seek the Lord together. If you're here every week, I'm glad that you keep tuning in. If you're one of the faithful for posting photos, participating in comments and images tied to our morning's themes, then thank you for keeping this place as a place of engagement. If you are here because somebody shared a link with you or you have a connection to someone who calls Glen Elm home, we are really Grateful that you're here, and we would love to see a comment or a photo of your presence as well. Thank you for being here, friends. As we develop the theme of our morning, I want us to put forward the word faithfulness. Now, to some, faithfulness might quickly feel like a Bible word. For others, they're thinking, no, 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 it's not just a Bible word. It's a relationship word. It's about friendships. It's about marriages. It's about commitment. Certainly, it is a quality of God's. And that's what I want us to highlight. And so a depiction of faithfulness. What is faithfulness? To the kids out there, could you describe what faithfulness means? Faithfulness is something that... It's something that lasts. It's something that sticks around. It's something that happens over and over and over again. And so there are actually many verses in the Bible that talk about God's faithfulness and use examples from nature. Things that happen over and over again. Cycles that are so predictable that we know they'll happen. After one ends, it will start again. And God is like that. And so take a moment, pause this if you wish, brainstorm together the young minds, the old minds, the wise minds, the minds that might need a little help. Brainstorm together and get an image of faithfulness. It might be an item in your home, might be a picture on your wall. It might be something you need to draw. Maybe you'll have to work this one out as a piece of art. Maybe you need to Google the perfect image. But get that thing snapped. Post it so that we have a growing collection, a gallery of images of faithfulness. And let's focus on the faithfulness of God as we move forward. We have the opportunity to learn from two of our friends again this morning under the heading of One Thing I've Learned. One of them is right here in Saskatchewan. One of them is farther away in a different country. But I want first to welcome Ray McMillan. Ray and Ellen have been deeply woven into this church family for many years. If you are newer to Glen Elm, then perhaps you haven't had as much opportunity to cross paths with them, but Ray was our senior minister for many years at a time when my faith was being formed in southwest Saskatchewan and a little bit in Manitoba and then here in Regina. During that span of young adult years, Ray's voice was a very predominant and formative voice for me as he emphasized the gospel of grace that we find in Jesus Christ. Ray and Ellen continue to call Regina home, though recent years have seen Ray continue to make his regular trips to India. The love of that nation and those people goes back to the 1960s, and that is a story unto itself for Ray to tell. He makes allusion to it in his sharing, and so if you weren't familiar, I wanted you to feel informed. Ray and Alan spend their summers outside of the city, and he makes allusion to that too, so now you know it's coming. Ray, it's a real privilege to hear from you this way. Thank you for pushing record on that phone and pushing send to share these things with us. It's a pleasure to learn from you one more time. Lessons that have come our way this summer during COVID-19. A couple of them. One is, as some of you know, Ellen and I spend the summer in our little old house in Kennedy, Saskatchewan. If you take Highway 48 from Regina and go southeast for a couple hours, and watch closely on the south side of the road, you might spy the village of Kennedy. Kind of a sleepy place nowadays. They say when both Ellen and I are there, population rises over 200, up to 201. Well, 60 years ago it was different. I remember Saturday night in Kennedy, used to be the time when all the farmers came to town and the main street was buzzing. A couple of Saturday nights ago, Ellen and I strolled down Main Street, and it's wide. You can make a U.E. right in the middle of the street with no problem at all. No people, 
No cars, not even a dog. Very quiet. So quiet that COVID-19 hasn't even found the place. And that's what's very wonderful about village life. Village life, not so bad. We've had an opportunity to have our grandchildren there and some of you have dropped in to visit. Um, so come our way. Second thing is that COVID-19 has uh, come at the same time as things like Zoom, FaceTime, all these technological things that have made reaching the other side of the world so convenient, so easy, and so inexpensive. Most of you know, those of you that have listened to me through the years, that my main goal in visiting Myanmar and Northeast India has been to provide some teaching and encouragement for our friends there. Technology gives us an opportunity to continue that. The little group in Imphal, Northeast India, Zooms its Sunday morning service. It happens at 8 o'clock Sunday morning, and that's 8.30 here in Saskatchewan on Saturday night. So we have had the opportunity of sitting in on their worship service, and we have also had the opportunity of participating. I say to them, it's very interesting. I can visit all of your homes in just one hour, find you sitting in your living rooms, um, sitting outside, or some of you are even sitting on your beds, and we just come in and have a visit. So the purpose of our ministry really continues, the opportunity to provide teaching and encouragement. So COVID-19, those are a couple things, a couple lessons that you brought my way. I don't like you. I hope you go away. I mean COVID-19, not the people I'm talking to uh, this morning. Uh, we, we long to visit with you again, and may God provide that opportunity in the near future. But it looks like uh, we're in this for a duration. As far as India trips are concerned, there certainly won't be one this year and not likely next year. Maybe they have come to an end. So, uh, God bless you. Love you. We'll see you, we hope, sooner than later. Thank you, Ray, for sharing with us one more time. And bless you and Ellen as you enjoy rural Saskatchewan for the rest of the summer. And bless you as you host all those who make their way your direction. Thanks for the reminders also of relationships, of companionship, of sharing one another's lives, be they right across the living room, be they across the ocean, only through technology, but you and Ellen have been a long time modeling for us of hospitality, of connection, of commitment to seeking out others, to invest in them, to encourage them, to build them up. And you have modeled that graciously and beautifully for us for a long time. And so bless you both as you continue to be those wonderful people. I'm not sure how you showed up at service today. Take a moment and figure out what is happening inside. What are you feeling? What are you thinking? What are you carrying? It strikes me yet again that these are strange days, but not just strange days. They are days with a lot of heaviness, be it COVID-19, be it protests against racial injustice or police brutality, be it other forms of stress that are more personal to you or widespread forms of stress that feel like they're in the headlines of the news every day. There are a lot of things to carry. And as I visit with people in recent days, I get a sense that many of us are carrying them. There's a lot of heaviness filling our world these days and much of it gets into our hearts. 
and into our thoughts and we carry it along with us. And that's just part of living on planet Earth where the needs are many. And the redemption that we see promised in scripture has a long way to go yet before we see it brought to completion. I want us to read together a few verses from Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations is a short little book in your Old Testament mingled in near the prophet Jeremiah. It speaks about heavy times. Times when life is full of suffering and struggle and the prophets are weighing in on what that time is supposed to do to the people of God. But it is having an effect of breaking them down and the prophets hope that it is softening them and not hardening them. As you read through Lamentations chapter 3, you find these descriptions that the speaker feels as if he is being torn to pieces, as if he is left in a state of desolation. He feels like his soul is lacking peace. He's forgotten what happiness feels like. He feels as if the endurance that he once enjoyed has completely disappeared. There's this feeling of being worn right out. <sighs> what does one do from that place? In Lamentations 3.21, But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. And so as we worship this morning, it's not light. It's not trite. It's not a denial of the heaviness that lives around us, maybe inside us. It's a choice, along with the prophet in Lamentations, to say, from this place of burden, which has bent us right over, what's the best possible move? We could get bitter. We could be hard. We could isolate ourselves from the people around us or from the God who loves us. We could make any number of moves. But the wisdom in Lamentations is to say, no, one more time, I will remember the faithfulness of the Lord. As the sun came up this morning, I got the reminder that the Lord is always faithful. Great is his faithfulness. And so Aaron Friesen is here to lead us in one song of worship, and then I'll tag on a second one, and we'll continue to make declarations of truth together through song and through lyric. I need to hear my voice making them. I may need to hear your voice making them. And you need the same things. So let's worship together. Good morning, Glen Elm family. It feels like it's been a long time since we have been together. Um, but I want you to know that, um, that I think of you all often and spend time praying for you. If uh, your picture is up on the, in the foyer there, where we have kind of our family pictures there, then, then you have been prayed for. If you have something hanging up here in the prayer room that you have written, then I've been praying for you and uh, trusting that um, the Lord continues to reveal himself to you and that you are creating open space for him to, to move in your life. And so, yeah, I, just, uh, I hope this morning is a blessing to you and I hope you know you're not uh, forgotten or um, abandoned. Um, yeah, if you are feeling that way or if you're feeling lonely or disconnected, then please reach out to someone. Give me a call. I would love to uh, take you out for a coffee. And I'm sure other people would too. So thanks. Have a great morning.
is alive and he saves. He rescues and saves. Yeah. Shout it out and lift up one voice in worship. Shout it out until all the earth can hear it. Jesus is alive and he saves. He rescues. Thank you, Aaron, for leading us in that song. I love the phrase, you have won me. What a phrase to sing to the Lord. He's the one who has done what's necessary to make us his own, but it is a victory about which he has very strong feelings. It's not like he won some minor prize at the county fair and he's just going to forget about it when he gets home and life moves on. He treasures us. He's paid a high price and he has full intention to take to the end the fulfillment of one life, of one life, of many lives, of all of his creation. And that's why he's worthy of praise as that song concludes. So thank you, Aaron, for reminding us of God's victory. And what I'm suggesting is that it's a symbol then of faithfulness. He is winning us over and over and over again. It's not even a one-time act of love or act of sacrifice. Jesus wins us. The Lord wins us and makes us his over and over again. When I was 21 years old in 1998, I married Shannon. At that point, she was midway through her university years, and I knew that she would be busy with homework and studying and labs, and I would have some time on my hands so I bought myself the cheapest, bottomest, endest guitar that the local music store had, and I took it home. I went to the Bible bookstore, and I bought myself a chord book that had some of the songs that were being sung at the time, and I determined that I would teach myself how to strum a few of them. And one in particular in that book was my motivator. I wanted to be able to strum quickly and smoothly enough that I could sing without interruption or choppiness the song Faithful One. And I want us to sing that this morning as one declaration of God's faithfulness to us. Faithful One, so unchanging Ageless One, you're my
Thank you, Aaron, for leading us. And thank you, Jason, for leading that song. That's always been a favorite of mine. You don't say. One of mine as well. No kidding. It's actually one of the songs that made me buy a guitar in the first place. You'll have to tell me that story sometime. Moving on. Let's move to our second installment of One Thing I've Learned. We've got Stephen Backhouse as one of our guests today, all the way from the countryside of England. Stephen and I had a Zoom call earlier this week. Our Zoom settings were a little bit off so that you do hear and see both of us, but I wanted it to be side by side at the same time. What it turns out being is you see me when I'm speaking and then you see him when he's speaking. So a little choppier than intended, but there's some valuable insights here that I think will be meaningful for you. And so thank you, Stephen, for being part of our service. If you're not familiar with this man, Stephen and Claire Backhouse are friends to Shannon and me, but they have visited here in Glen Elm and in Regina on more than one instance, and they have become friends to many of you as well. And it's a treat for us to have you as part of our service today, Stephen. Welcome. We're recording on to here. Is it giving you any kind of a notification? It says recording. Okay. That's all. When a friend did this with me, it gave me a, it gave me a notice like, this is being recorded. Are you okay with that? <laughs> But I guess I we're recording. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Anything I say can and will be used against me. All right. Can you hear me okay if I have yeah. my headphones off like this? Yeah, I hear you fine. So I'll introduce this real quick and then we'll, yeah, we'll set you up for your single sentence summary and we'll flesh it out in a few minutes. All right. Good morning, friends. I have the pleasure of visiting with Stephen Backhouse this morning. This call is being recorded a few days ago through Zoom, but many of you have familiarity with Stephen and Claire. They have been friends to Shannon and me for several years. They have been guests in our church on a number of occasions, and I know some of you have gone on to create your own friendships with them. I know there are a number in our church who subscribe to the Tent Theology podcast that Stephen has started during COVID-19, so take this as an extra. This is a bonus session for any of you podcast listeners. Stephen, thanks for visiting, my friend. Yeah, I wish I could see everyone again, but it's nice. To, I'll just see. I'll just look at you, and I'll pretend that you are Glen Elm. If you're looking at his screenshot, you'll see he's in his English garden shed turned recording studio. In the background. Comic book display. There are Star Wars figurines around that room somewhere. Anyway, I'm grateful for the chance to visit. I told Stephen we've been having this summer series under the heading of One Thing I've Learned. And he threw out a couple possibilities of what he's learned. But if you were giving a quick summary this morning, Stephen, what is one thing you've learned that we might talk about for a few minutes? I guess the thing I learned was about the limited value of argument or the limited value of being right. I don't know how to say it in one word. The limited value of winning an argument. Okay. There you go. I learned that there's, there's a limit to it and it's not even that, not even that important. And did you learn this from winning a bunch of arguments and not finding that as impressive as you thought it would be? Or did you learn this from losing a bunch of arguments and realizing it didn't matter that I lost them? Like, how did you make this discovery? I guess, I guess when I say argument, I think I'm specifically talking about things of Christ or things of, of faith. You're sort of talking about the realm of apologetics in some yeah, ways. So like, I guess so when I, when I uh, uh, for the first 20 years of my life or so, I was... Yep pretty grounded in in you know your kind of um josh mcdowell's or lee is it lee strobel or sure. uh, uh ravi zacharias that, that that kind of crowd which is all about apologetics which is all about there's a reasonable arguments that you can give to, to objections to the christian faith and okay and i guess i that was part of the world that i was grew up in and then but then when i went to university here in england so i was Grew up in Alberta, but I moved to England when I was 19. And I started going to university a couple of years after that. And I was studying philosophy yep. uh, as an undergraduate. And I pretty quickly came to the realization that you can argue almost anything. Like you can, you can <laughs> come to a reasonable conclusion about almost any position. Okay. So there are many defensible positions. That's what you were yeah. starting to realize. Yeah. Like winning an argument was not the same as being right or mm. being true. Okay. And and likewise losing an argument wasn't the same. Like I could lose an argument 
with somebody about right. something I knew to be true. Right. You know, uh, and yet it was, I knew it was still true. It's just yes. that I wasn't good at arguing it. Uh, <laughs> and likewise, I could be in a room with a really clever person who was making a reasonable, logical, watertight argument about something, but it didn't, it wasn't persuasive to me personally, and it didn't right. have to be. Yes. So I just realized that, that that whole kind of, I call it the apologetics industry. It's the whole industry itself I found a little bit like empty calories, really. I just mm-hmm. kind of saw, oh, it doesn't, nobody really cares if you win an argument. Like when I was in these environments, like. That by itself really didn't have enough power or, somehow. Could defend six day creationism or the rapture or the resurrection or whatever thing I was supposed to defend as sure. an evangelical Christian. Yep. People don't care. And so actually, they care whether you're a jerk or not. <laughs> or, you know, whether you like them or not. Well, there's no, and there's something important there because I've, I have felt it in myself at times and I've certainly observed it and heard it in other people's voices where there's this imagining that I'm not a good enough uh, representative of yeah. Christianity. I'm not a good enough witness to it. And the problem is I don't have answers to all the questions. And yeah. if I had a better answer, if I was better with words, if I had sharper thoughts, then I could create such a compelling case for Christian faith that people would be helpless before me. I would be a compelling force pulling people through my persuasive powers to the gospel. Yeah. And you're saying that that doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. And also, you know, I, so I went to a, a, a famous university, one of the world's best universities. I went to Oxford University. Yep. And so I'm living in intellectually elite environments. Right. And I was in rooms with these famous people, genuinely intelligent sure. people, the best philosophical minds alive, you know. And I could see that winning arguments was kind of a game. It didn't really That's right. matter because you can win arguments all the time. And yep. These people were thinking it matters more if you live it out mm. or if you can walk the talk, right? Or if you For practice sure. what you preach, that's what's more important. Yes. Because anybody can win an argument. Who cares? Yeah. And, uh, and I, I kind of saw the, I saw the limited value of being the cleverest person in the room, mm. but I learned it from the cleverest people in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and so like one example would be my, my philosophy tutor. His name is Dave Leal. Okay. And he was my philosophy tutor, really, you know, kind, like really kind man, but yes. also kind of a eccentric. He would never wear shoes. He was always wearing, <laughs> never shaved his beard. He looked a bit like a, a tall hobbit, big, <laughs> you know, or a dwarf or something. Big beard, <laughs> never wore shoes. Yeah. Very eccentric guy. And really smart. Sure. But it wasn't his intelligence that was made what he said true or not it was fact he was really kind Um, and he and his wife looked out looked out for people and they took care of undergraduates who were new to the system and hmm. and when claire and i started going out as undergraduates he and his wife took us aside and gave us some really good advice because dave and his wife were married um christians believers who got married young and claire and i were thinking of getting married and my philosophy tutor really encouraged us and gave us really good advice. And it wasn't the fact that he was smart that made what he said true. Right. It was that he was a good guy. Yeah. And he cared for people and he was humble. Yeah. And it, it sort of took the lid off. And like I said, I've been in rooms with, with other people with, with who were winning arguments or, and, and I could see that the, the apologetics industry outside of those rooms was saying things like, Oh, look at these guys. They're, they're winning all these arguments and they're converting all these atheists. But I was in the rooms and I could tell that there was no atheists in those rooms. It was just a bunch of other Christians. <laughs> Having conversation. And the other Christians were being encouraged because they were listening to smart people tell them sure. how, how intelligent Christianity could be, mm. which is fine. Which has a value of its own, right? It, it has can, a value, but yep. I can tell you it was not hordes of people being converted to Christ because Ravi Zacharias won an, an argument. Right. It was hordes of people who were already called themselves Christians right. being encouraged in their faith, which is fine. Sure. But let's be honest about what was really going on there. So within, like, so at Glen Elm, we've got a mission statement on our wall that's really concise. It's four words. It's that we wish to be people who are seeking Christ, sharing Christ, 
And I know a lot of times when people think of that sharing Christ, like I said, there's a tendency to think that some of it is about, I need to be able to present. I need to be able to convince, to compel. Um, But you're saying, oh man, the power of the sharing is in the, it's in your person. It's in your life far more than it is in your thoughts or your words. I can, if if you love the Bible so much, I can only point you to the apostle Paul said, if I speak with the tongues of angels, but I'm a big fat jerk, (laughs) like banging symbols. That's the back house translation. Yep. And, and Jesus, you know, he tells the story about the sheep and the goats. Yes. And he finds a group of people who are really eloquent and articulate and are able to proclaim his name. And he looks at them and he says, I didn't know know you. you. Right. You didn't take care of the lo- the lost and the poor you didn't visit yep. people in prison you didn't give them cups of cold water so it's like yeah you know you don't have to stray that far from the christian documents to get it doesn't no. matter if you win arguments it matters whether you're a kind and good person or not for sure and also i mean we think of jesus and he's talking about the fruit and the tree right how yeah. do you how do you assess value measure the fruit on the tree it's yeah. not hard it's it's not like and you will you know it's not like you'll know that, that they are my followers by their ability to discuss the resurrection right or to explain the trinity without faltering right no it's by my love and by your fruits yeah um you know i often like to point out being right isn't one of the fruits of the holy spirit <laughs> <laughs> no but we want it often don't we we love it and that's part of our temptation to power. We like to dominate the room. We like to mm. silence other people. We want to have only our voice being heard. or we want to. It's a power thing, really. Sure. Which is and already miles away from anything Jesus-centered. Miles away. You know, Bonhoeffer, the famous German theologian, he said the gospel is weak. The hmm. gospel can be beaten in any argument. Hmm. It's, like it's so weak it can be nailed to a cross. Well. Wow. Right? Yep. The truth of the gospel is not that it dominates a room and wins an argument and compels people. It lays itself down and it says, mm. what do you think? Do you want Do you want this or not? Yeah. And you can say no. Mm. And then it doesn't try and browbeat you and destroy you and dominate you. It just For lets sure. you say no. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. To anyone who's listening this morning and feels, just feels like, oh, this is, this is touching. This is connecting. I can feel the truth of this. Do you have any sort of practical counsel for someone? Is this just as simple as, is this Bill and Ted go and be excellent to each other? And that's all? Or what could a person take away from this to to not clutter up their life of faith, to keep things simple and beautiful and as Jesus-centered as possible? I mean, I've said this before. I know anybody who listens to the podcast or has heard me speak will have heard me say this. But just remember the word faith in the New Testament. Yep doesn't mean it's not about your head understanding it's not a head thing right it's follow me right so it's, are you ashamed so if you have faith in jesus it's because you you are not ashamed to be seen to be with him or right. you are following his way yeah and so when you're supposed to go and you know share the faith or preach christ sure that's what you do it's not about intellectually having lots of clever answers or saying things really well. It's like, are you following the way of Jesus? Yep. And so I think anybody can do that. And definitely everybody can do that. Mm. And you don't need a degree from Oxford to do that. No, not even close. Thank you, my friend. That's a valuable lesson. I'm grateful for all the ways you've learned it. And I'm grateful you took some time to share it with us. I know folks at Glen Elm have appreciated you and Claire when you've been either in touch through communications online or email. I know that they've appreciated time when you guys have been present here. Someday, sometime, airplanes will fly again. Masks will not be part of our daily wardrobes. We will reconnect at some point. I miss, we really miss it. We'd love, we, we, almost every day we say how much we'd love to be back. Tell the, tell the people what you do with your, what's your daily coffee ritual? What do you put in your cup to get your little fix each day? Shannon sends me a, a bag of Tim Hortons hazelnut coffee <laughs> and, and I, I eke it out and I always mix it with something else. So I never use the full amount. I always put a little smidgen of Tim Hortons 
coffee in my morning coffee. Every couple of months, a new bag arrives. This is how he nurses his Canadian connection one cup at a time. Absolutely. That's right. Well, we're grateful to keep feeding the habit. Thanks for your time, Steve, and I appreciate it, my friend. Well, lots of love to everyone. And Claire sends her love to you. She's, she's actually on a call to a client right now. She's a nutritional therapist and she sees her clients online, but she would otherwise send her love. Yes. No, I know there are a few at Glen Elm who have actually consulted with Claire on oh, nutritional wow. topics. So oh, there's wow. a little extra referral if you're needing help with your health. Brilliant. Very good. Thank you, Stephen. Bless you. Thanks again to Stephen for being part of our service this week. If you are looking for some of the teaching that Stephen is currently producing and sharing, then searching for Tent Theology would take you to either his website or to a podcast by the same name. And if you are looking to enter the conversation that might be facilitated by a political theologian, then you may find those resources helpful and valuable. Before we conclude our service with communion, I want to be the voice of reminder on a handful of topics. Remember to get that photo posted, a photo of you, or a comment of what's been meaningful this morning, or a photo on that theme of faithfulness. Let's develop this idea together. Be sure to send a word of thankfulness or appreciation to our leaders for the morning. We've been blessed by Ray and by Aaron and by Stephen. And so thank you, gentlemen, for leading us this morning. If anything they've shared has blessed or touched you, then be sure to express your appreciation. A reminder that last Sunday was our second missions offering of the year. In previous weeks, we had highlighted the work of Let's Start Talking Canada and the Gentle Road Church of Christ, but we want to give one more opportunity. So if you missed that, three ways to give. These are the avenues by which you can participate in our regular offering, but if you're giving something specifically to the missions offering, then all three ways of giving would have a way in which you could add a note on your check or a note on your e-transfer, or you could select the option from the online giving so that we can clearly tell which money was being given toward our missions offering. And be reminded that our AGM for this year is tonight. That last sentence is based on the presumption that you're watching this video on Sunday, August 30th. We'll be having our meeting through Zoom at 6 p.m. Instructions relating to Zoom and the links to the meeting were sent out earlier this week, so we look forward to seeing you there. We will be presuming that everyone in attendance has familiarity with the reports that were emailed out a couple weeks ago, so we won't be covering that ground aside from hitting some of the highlights. There are a few motions regarding financial items that need to be accepted, and there'll be some opportunity for discussion or questions that need to be covered before we conclude. So we're aiming to keep our meeting fairly streamlined, but we look forward to having as many of you as are able to attend. Finally, our leadership team continues to visit about what church life might look like in the months ahead. So in last week's church email, there was a link to a survey where we are seeking some of your input. We would like to make decisions informed by some of the priorities and values, the levels of caution and the levels of eagerness that exist within our church family. And so there's a lot of people living a lot of lives, but we want to hear from you. And so thanks to those who have very quickly clicked on that link and filled things out. But if you haven't completed that survey yet, we would love to hear from you. This will help us make informed decisions about many facets of our church life as September arrives this week and then as the fall unfolds before us. And so we want to hear from you. Please take the time to share with us. As I alluded to earlier, these are days when things can get on us. They can hang on us. They can travel along with us. It's easy to pick up baggage and burdens. And there's no minimizing some of the heaviness that lives in the world today, but it does make one wonder, how do I walk wisely through these days? Is there a better way or a worse way to do it? I'm confident there is. I find some comfort and some counsel in the words of Paul in Philippians chapter 4. From a prison cell, he advises his readers, fix your thoughts on what is true, on what is honorable, on what is right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And of course, those types of descriptives point our minds upward. Because as I alluded to earlier, when I'm faced with heaviness, I have some impulses that if I'm not careful, they just take over. And some of my impulses are to close up to get really cynical, to get a little more negative. My lenses get darkened and even things that aren't dark start to appear dark because my lenses 
have tinted. Sometimes it's a stepping back, an act of isolation from the people around me, or even from the God who loves me. And so here you have Paul saying, seek out things that are good, that are honorable, that are praiseworthy, that are excellent. Don't harden yourself against these things. You could, if you weren't careful, a hard world can make hard people, but we're not trying to be hard people. We're trying to be open. We're trying to remain tender, tender to God, tender to the ones around us, even tender to a world that we are attempting to live within and to be blessings within. And so coming to the communion table together is another good reminder because here we have the Lord who keeps himself constantly tender toward us, toward neediness, toward brokenness. And communion reminds us, yeah, right, he hasn't hardened himself against us. He keeps the doors wide open. He keeps his hands wide open. The table is always set. The invitation is always wide reaching. And so we are reminded of his love and his faithfulness. And it drives us to come back yet again. We don't harden ourselves today. We open ourselves today, trusting that the faithfulness of God will indeed be enough for us today, enough for us tomorrow, enough for us until the end of the age. Thank you, Father, for faithfulness that never fails. Thank you, Jesus, for steady love. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for ongoing presence within our lives and within our world. We pray that you will bring about the redemption of all of creation. We know you've paid for this. May you receive that which you have purchased. Amen. If you wish to pause so that you can partake of communion more slowly, then do that. That would allow you to handle it as you wish within your setting. If you leave our recording run, we will conclude with a song. A fun little backstory on this song. When I get into my van with our girls, they frequently ask for some music to be played. One of their favorite bands is a group called For King and Country, led by two brothers named Joel and Luke. And as I learned about these musicians, I discovered something to share with my girls. I said, do you know that these two singers have an older sister named Rebecca who was a recording artist when I was in high school and college and I remember being quite influenced by some of her music at that point in life and so that got them curious but I said I haven't heard anything from her in years I think she's disappeared and her brothers have taken the spotlight lo and behold this summer Rebecca St. James returned to release a new album led by this song which she sings with one of her brothers it's a song called Dawn and it's about the faithfulness of God. And there are many good lines in it, and you'll find the lyrics that connect with you. But the bridge is perhaps the part that connects with me most. Watch for these words as the song is sung. You are faithful, and you bring the dawn. And I don't know what pictures you posted of faithfulness, but certainly the image of the sun coming up every morning. It sets again, but it keeps coming up, and tomorrow it will be there, and the next day it will be there. You are faithful. And you bring the dawn. And sometimes when things feel dark or things feel scary or things feel uncertain to the point that we wonder how we're going to find our next step, the declaration that God is faithful and he will always bring the dawn is maybe a word we need as we partake again of the tokens of his love and faithfulness, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Bless you as you do that in your settings, friends. We will Meet again next week. Until we do, may the love of God the Father, may the grace of the Lord Jesus, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Hold on, please.
Smile. 